Hello everyone, uh, my name is Yui Takeshita from the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute and today uh, I will be talking to you about the uh, about oxygen measurements from BGC profiling floats and this talk is a part of the Go BGC uh, uh, Science Workshop in 2021. I want to start this talk by showing this uh, animation that shows the location of profiling floats equipped with oxygen sensors that have been deployed so far. Uh, the first oxygen flow was deployed in 2002, and uh, and it really had the number of profiles per uh, number of float oxygen profiles per year has steadily grown from about 2004 to 2014, and has stabilized at about 20,000 profiles per year. And uh, oxygen sensors were the first of a biogeochemical sensors to be integrated onto profiling floats, and therefore it is the most common uh, sensor in the BGC uh, uh, float array. And I would like to mention that the first 12 uh, BG Go BGC floats uh, were deployed in the North Atlantic earlier this year, uh, and of course all of them are equipped with oxygen sensors. But given the long history of oxygen sensors uh, on profiling floats, they have gone through uh, quite a bit of evolution, both in terms of sensing technology, uh, understanding of sensing principles, and also data management and everything else. And then so, for example, the earlier, the first um, oxygen sensors uh, that were deployed on profiling floats were the uh, based on Clark electrode the technology shown on the left. But over the years, the uh, these were replaced and now um, uh, replaced by optical oxygen sensors, uh, typically referred to as optodes. And this was mainly because optodes had uh, f um, were far more stable once they were deployed relative to uh, Clark electrodes. And then so this technology became the preferred uh, sensor by the oceanographic community. So in this talk, I'm only going to focus on uh, oxygen optodes on profiling floats and not talk about previous um, sensing technologies. And furthermore, uh, not all optodes are created equally. Uh, and because, and then so I'm really only going to talk about uh, two oxygen optodes, the Ondera uh, ox oxygen sensors, so model 3830 and 4830, and also Seabird 63s shown on the left and the right, uh, respectively. And this is because uh, these two uh, sensor types and models have been thoroughly characterized in the literature, and therefore we can confidently. Uh, say that we understand the response as a function of you know variety of environmental conditions such as uh, temperature, uh, pressure, and uh, flow. And so, uh, but you know, so but there, I, there are other oxygen optodes that have uh, that are commercially available and have been deployed on profiling floats, uh, but uh, they either you know they haven't been as thoroughly characterized. In the literature, so there's no guarantee that their performance is comparable to these well-studied uh, models uh, on DERA and Seabird 63s. And but the basic chemicals, uh, the sensing principles, and the theory behind their operation should be the same. So the most of the information that I talk about today should be um, translatable to uh, the different uh, the other opto types as well. The main difference between the two. Uh, Sensors, as you can see, is that the Ondera uh, on the left is exposed to the environment, whereas the Seabird 63 is uh, integrated into the pump flow stream of the CTD. And then, so what that allows uh, the Seabird 63 to do is to have a faster response time relative to the Ondera. However, uh, since it's not exposed, since it's in the pump flow stream, it doesn't get exposed to air uh, once the flow surfaces, and then so only the Onderas currently are capable of doing air calibrations. And I, I will talk more about this in detail later in the talk. But these are the uh, these are the two main differences between the two uh, sensor models. And I would also like to mention that there are excellent resources out there to get more uh, uh, more information about oxygen sensors on profiling fluids, and I have. Um, provided to here. On the right is the Argo data uh, management document, processing Argo oxygen data at the DAC level. And this has this has all of the sensing principles as well as how oxygen uh, sensor data is corrected and managed in the Argo data system, including all of the equations and um, the code necessary to do those uh, calculations. And on the left is a review paper by Bidig et al. in 2018 that thoroughly covers, uh, as the title suggests, uh, 
principle, characterization, calibration, and application of oxygen optodes with a heavy focus on profiling floats. And this is an uh, excellent paper, and most of my um, um, talk is based around this, uh, this review paper. So, um, okay, so let's get started. So oxygen optodes use luminescence quenching as the sensing principles to measure oxygen. So I'm going to uh, try to go through what that is. So uh, there, so this black box is the membrane of the uh, of the oxygen optode, and inside it is composed uh, of these luminophores shown uh, represented as the orange circle. So luminophores. Uh, when they are hit with a specific wavelength of light, in this case blue, they are transitioned into an excited state, so in this is denoted as L star. And then <clears throat> to return back to its original state, it will emit red light. And so if you were to measure the intensity of the excitation uh, 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 light, which is uh, shown in blue, and the emission shown in red, it will look something like this. Uh, but the, this process takes a little bit of time, and then so uh, the luminophore continues to emit red light until uh, it fully uh, goes back to its uh, original uh, state. And then so this intensity decays over time, and so this uh, emission can also be described, so the lifetime uh, is the e-folding time of how long this, uh, uh, the emission lasts after it is excited. Uh, so this the uh, top plot is in the case when there's no oxygen. But if there's oxygen present, uh, and if it is in contact with the luminophore, now when the luminophore is excited, then it can actually um, transfer some of its energy to the oxygen molecule directly, and at the same time also emit red light. But because it's losing some of its energy to oxygen, the uh, emission intensity is reduced, as well as the um, lifetime of the decay. And then so, Basically, if there's oxygen, then both intensity and also the um, lifetime decreases. And so these are the two things that we could potentially measure to, uh, to, uh, to get the oxygen concentration. But intensity in general is not the preferred method because uh, intensity of your excitation uh, signal it, uh, could change over time due to a number of reasons such as temperature or just aging of the LED itself. And so lifetime uh, is a much more robust uh, measurement for the sensor response. So this is what we uh, tend to uh, use instead of intensity. Okay, so in practice, so how do we, actually, how do we implement this is that we actually pulse the excitation uh, uh, LED, and then so it's shown in the plot on the top right here. And then so you pulse the intensity of the LED at a known frequency, and then the resultant uh, uh, emission and the excitation spectra look something like this. And then so as you can see, if you look at the phase of the excitation and emission spectra, basically the distance between the uh, peak amplitudes, you can see that there is a phase shift. And then so where um, the emission phase uh, lags behind the excitation phase, and uh, the phase shift for in this case is 63.9 degrees. But when there's oxygen present, then um, the both intensity, but also since the lifetime is shorter, then the phase shift is shorter relative to when there is no oxygen present. So you can see by the dashed red line uh, that the um, phase, uh, the phase shift when oxygen is present is much larger than the phase shift uh, when oxygen is present. And then so this is how uh, so we take advantage of this fact. And this, you can make these measurements fairly robustly. And this is the analog signal that uh, we use to um, that the, that the optode reports. Okay, so then we can use the stern volmer equation to take the analog outputs from the uh, sensor, so either the intensity or the lifetime, and uh, convert it to oxygen concentration. And But as I mentioned before, uh, intensity is not um, a good parameter to use because it's, uh, it's fairly uh, unstable over time, so we want to use uh, the lifetime. So rearranging the equation gives you uh, this form of the equation. But so this is a certain volumer that relates oxygen concentration to uh, the lifetime of um, the emissions. But uh, we have to make uh, two uh, two modifications to this equation for our oxygen optos. The first 
remember, we don't actually measure uh, lifetime in our sensors. We, me we measure phase shift. So we have to replace the lifetime with phase shift. And we can do this because even though these, these parameters are not identical, they carry the same uh, information. So this substitute uh, works. And the second modification that we have to make is to replace this concentration of oxygen with partial pressure of oxygen. And this is because the sensor doesn't actually respond directly to concentration of oxygen, but rather responds to PO2. And here's the reason why. And this is, um, so the partial pressure of oxygen is, oh, so that's right. So uh, in order for the sensor to uh, respond to oxygen in solution, the uh, oxygen molecules need to diffuse through seawater into the membrane and interact with the luminophore, uh, like you see there. And then so the tendency for the oxygen molecules to uh, diffuse in and out of this, uh, this solution to membrane boundary is the partial pressure of oxygen. So, and then, but there's also a, uh, an opposing partial pressure uh, from the membrane sign as well. And then so as long as there's PO2 is greater in seawater than the membrane, then oxygen will continue to diffuse into the membrane until PO2 is equal, P, uh, PO2 on both sides is equal to one another. And this is when you have a stable oxygen, uh, stable sensor reading. But, uh, but the problem, but in the, I guess not the problem, but the problem is that uh, because these two, the membrane and seawater are, you know, have very different chemical properties, they also have very different solubilities. So what that means is that even if the PO2 of the two, um, the membrane and the seawater are not are the same, the concentration of oxygen can be different uh, because again, the solubility is different. And so this is why you know we need to replace the concentration of oxygen with PO2 because the sensor really is responding to PO2 of seawater and not the concentration of oxygen. Uh, in seawater. Okay, and then so now this is the so now this is the modified stern volmer uh, equation uh, that can be used to calculate PO2 or to measure PO2, and then we can calculate concentration of oxygen uh, by uh, multiplying the PO2 by Henry's constant, which is the solubility. Okay, so uh, in order to put this into kind of practice, we need to understand how uh, how to parameterize this equation and no, uh, to fully understand how the sensor uh, responds to various environmental conditions. And the four parameters that we need to think about, uh, think about are temperature, pressure, uh, salinity, and also response time of the sensor. So I'll step through these one by one. Uh, so um, temperature is, uh, the temperature effects on the sensor is characterized during the calibration process. And the pressure effects are corrected uh, after the data is correct, uh, collected uh, because the pressure effects is due to thermodynamic effects. So they can be, um, so they're very predictable. Salinity effects are also post-corrected most of the time, and I'll explain why it's most of the time um, in a second, but this uh, corrects for solubility effects. And the response time uh, is dependent on temperature and flow, and but it is not currently implemented by um, GOBGC for the data that we report um, because we don't always have all the necessary information to parameterize it accurately. Okay, so let's start with the temperature effects. So this is a plot that shows lifetime on the y-axis, or you can think of that as phase shift as well, or the sensor response, uh, versus partial pressure of oxygen on the x-axis. And as you can see what temperature does, so warmer temperatures are in the uh, redder colors, uh, it tends to um, reduce the sensor response or the, sen the phase shift of uh, this, uh, the, the sensor at a given um, PO2. And then so to fully characterize the uh, temperature response of of any given sensor, you need to measure the phase shift over a large range of temperature and also partial pressure of oxygen. So if and then fit that to the stern volmer equation. So when you do that, you can create a sensor response surface like this. And then so the uh, black dots are where are where reference measurements were taken uh, through uh, Winkler titrations. So this is where you know what, what the PO2 is. And then on the x-axis on the left is temperature, and the y-axis on the right is phase shift. Uh, 
So you can see uh, that as uh, temperature increases going left, then the phase shift uh, decreases, like I was shown in the plot below. So as long as you, create, uh, you have enough reference measurements scattered throughout this sensor measurement surface, then you can fully characterize the uh, temperature response of the sensor itself. And so this process uh, is com typically referred to the multi-point calibration uh, because you know it's calibrated using multiple points. Um, but in, historically, there. And one thing to mention is that historically, not all optos were calibrated uh, using the multi-point calibration. And uh, you know, a while a while back, uh, the optos were much more commonly calibrated using the batch calibration. And what this basically means is that the optos were not individually calibrated, but rather the, only the foils were calibrated. So the sensing foils uh, from a single batch, uh, only a subset of them were calibrated, and then assume that that behavior uh, held true for all of the um, all the other sensors that came out of that single batch. And then so this uh, turned out that the, the quality of the calibration using this approach <clears throat> was less robust and much more variable than the multi-point calibration. And this plot, um, I apologize for the x-axis, the x-axis um, is these, uh, our float serial numbers. And so, but you can just think of them as older floats on the left and newer floats on the right. And then everything on the left side of the dashed black dot were uh, optos using batch calibrations. And then uh, all the floats on the right are floats that were calibrated using multi-point calibration. And then the y-axis, is the amount of adjustment that we that had to be made to the oxygen data. So you can see that uh, the optodes from the batch calibration era, uh, the data had to be adjusted uh, much, typically in higher magnitude and also was way more variable than multi-point calibrated optodes. So this is um, just kind of a, you know, I guess, you know, like a, you know, we strongly suggest that if anyone is thinking of, you know, purchasing optodes for, especially for profiling for applications, we strongly recommend that um, the optodes be multi-point calibrated um, or else, you, you know, the quality of the data is getting substantially uh, worse and harder to um, correct. And fortunately, all the manufacturers that at least that I am aware of offer this multi-point calibration option. Okay, so now moving on to pressure effects. So pressure effect, there are two, uh, two impacts on, of pressure for the sensor response. The first is that under higher pressures, the uh, L-star or the excited state of the luminophore gets destabilized. And basically this manifests as a shift in uh, theta, or sorry, shift in phi or the, um, or the phase shift. And, um, and overall, it leads to a, a um, reduced, um, reduced a reduced phase shift. And the second effect is that um, under pressure, the PO2 in both uh, seawater and the membrane changes. And this is because PO2 is a thermodynamic, uh, a thermodynamic value, and then it's also, and then it's related to uh, the partial molar volume of oxygen. Uh, but because the, you know, again, the seawater and the membrane have different chemical properties, pressure affects PO2 uh, differently, and then it actually increases PO2 inside the membrane slightly more than seawater by about 4% uh, per 1,000 decibar. So what that means is that since PO2 increases inside the membrane, oxygen diffuses out into seawater, and therefore the sensor response decreases. Okay, so summarizing the pressure co uh, correction, the first step, uh, you have to correct for the excited luminophore uh, state destabilization, and you, you do this using the phase data. And the second step uh, is to correct for changes in PO2, uh, which decreases by about 4% per 1,000 decibars. And if you're interested in the uh, details and exact equations on how to make these corrections, um, uh, I refer you to uh, Bidig et al. 2018. Okay, so now salinity. So the salinity correction really accounts for the solubility effects um, for the uh, uh, for the, for the sensor. And so going back to how oxygen concentration is calculated. So first step, the sensor measures PO2 uh, based on the modified Stern-Volmer equation, and then this measured PO2 is converted 
to oxygen concentration using uh, the solubility constant KH. And KH is the uh, term that is dependent on salinity. And the, uh, and the sensor intrinsically is independent of salinity. It doesn't care what the solution uh, salinity is because remember it responds to partial pressure of oxygen and that is not influenced by uh, salinity. <clears throat> so uh, the only time it comes into play is the solubility constant. So if you calibrate the octode uh, to uh, partial pressure of oxygen, then we don't need any additional correct, uh, salinity correction. You just need to input salinity when you calculate the solubility constant. Be, but unfortunately, many manufacturers don't calibrate the uh, opto to uh, PO2, but rather they calibrate directly the oxygen concentration, typically in fresh water. So salinity of zero. And then so now you have a, a, a situation where the calibration salinity, uh, so now the sen sensor is now calibrated to a oxygen concentration, but it's actually responding to PO2. So then you have to account for the difference in solubility between the calibration solution, which is salinity zero, and seawater, which is typically salinity, you know, 33 to 36 or something like that. Um, so let me try to explain that a little bit. Uh, uh, let me try to explain that uh, using this following schematic. So uh, imagine, so during calibration, um, so the sensors have, is recording uh, stable measurements, that means that the partial pressure of oxygen inside the membrane is equal to the PO2 of the calibration uh, fluid, which, as I mentioned, typically is fresh water, is a salinity of zero. And then so fresh water holds more oxygen molecules than uh, seawater. And then so, so this is during the calibration. So imagine now the, now the sensor is now calibrated to this oxygen concentration. But now if it measures, um, a, a sample of seawater with the same partial pressure of oxygen because the solubility of oxygen is lower in seawater than in fresh water at the same uh, PO2 it would have a lower oxygen concentration so now you have a mismatch between uh, so now you have to uh, uh, correct, make an additional correction because the sensor is, you know, calibrated to the oxygen concentration at salinity zero, but now it's salinity at the same PO2, uh, the concentration is much lower, so that you have to account for that uh, change in concentration. That's where the salinity uh, cr additional correction uh, comes in. Okay, so um, summarizing the salinity correction, uh, first is that it's only necessary when uh, the optode is calibrated to concentration of oxygen rather than PO2. And unfortunately, that is the um, majority of the manufacturers calibrate to oxygen concentration. But And then the second point is that this correction really is about, um, it's accounting for the changes in the solubility between the calibration and the sample uh, solution. And then in order to apply this uh, correction, you need to know the calibration salinity, which is typically zero. Um, and make sure that the reference salinity is set uh, properly inside of the sensor itself. Okay, and the final um, final thing that we need to worry about is a response time. So it's fairly well known that optos have a fairly slow uh, response time, and that can lead to uh, relatively large or pretty large errors during, um, when there is a large oxygen gradient. And then so this is a, a plot of profile that shows uh, the oxygen profile on the left, the black and green uh, dark lines are profiles from uh, two separate floats. And on the right is the uh, error that can be caused by response time. And as you can see, uh, the error can be as high as, you know, close to 15 micromole per kilogram for this particular profile. And But the error can be as high as, you know, 30 micromolar if the uh, gradient is uh, even larger than this, uh, larger than this profile. So, but fortunately, um, there, uh, Bidigal 2017 uh, proposed a two-layer diffusion model that can correct uh, for uh, these uh, response time uh, errors. So, uh, how does how does that um, how does that model work? So, basically, the um, uh, the idea is that the luminophores that res that react or that respond to uh, the emission uh, the excitation um, light really only, um, well the excitation light really only interacts with luminophores that are in the back part of the membrane. And then so in order for oxygen to have an impact on the phase, uh, phase of, the, uh, of, this, of the signal, then oxygen needs to diffuse through 
um, the membrane and get to the back part of the membrane. <clears throat> and so this is the well, this is the first diffusion layer. And then so the response time uh, so this is uh, so then the response time of uh, this part of the diffusion layer is dependent on the thickness of the membrane and also temperature because diffusion is a temperature dependent process. And then so this is an intrinsic sensor uh, property, you know, because different sensor models use different thicknesses of of uh, the membrane. And uh, not much can really be done to um, change this, that, that part of the response. The second diffusion layer uh, is on the seawater side, and uh, it's at the, um, and it is a diffusion layer near the membrane seawater boundary. So anytime there is a, a solid to liquid boundary, there is always a diffusion layer. Um, layer and then the thickness and then again so the and then the thickness of this diffusion layer is the um is controlled by the flow outside of the sensor uh, flow around the sensor and this is because flow indu uh, induces turbulence and therefore uh, reduces the um, the thickness of the diffusive boundary layer and then so this uh, the the the, diffuse, the second diffusion layer is now a function of the flow around the sensor and also the temperature again because diffusion is a temperature dominant um, process so if flow if there's higher flow around the sensor then this diffusive boundary layer gets smaller and therefore the sensor response time uh, gets shorter because there's there's a shorter distance that the oxygen molecules need to diffuse to get into the membrane so the thickness of this uh, diffusive boundary layer uh, can be accurately uh, quantified for if the flow rate is uh, stable, like for the Seabird 63, where it's in the pump, uh, pumped uh, CTD flow stream, so the flow rate is uh, constant throughout the whole profile. But it's a little bit uh, different for the Ondera uh, optode, where it relies on the, the flow around the sensor is dependent on the geometry of you know which way the sensor is facing, as well as the float vertical velocity. So on average, the floats um, uh, 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 ascend at around 10 centimeters per second, but it you know the speed uh, varies depending on um, uh, the density of the water. And then so this this plot shows the boundary layer thickness. Uh, so this is the the boundary layer on the seawater side as a function of float vertical velocity. And then um, so all the faint points in the back are individual. Um, uh, estimates of that and then so the current parameterization kind of takes the average of all of these um, estimates uh, showing the black dashed line and but as you can see the uncertainty in this boundary layer thickness is quite large and at any given flow uh, velocity there's probably about a twofold uh, range in the boundary layer thickness so this is a challenge of trying to correct for response time for the unpumped uh, on their optodes and so there's a large much larger uncertainty for the response time correction associated with on relative to the seabird 63s okay uh, so let's summarize the response time correction so the response time of the optode can be corrected using a two uh, two layer diffusion model and the first diffusion layer uh, is inside the membrane, and uh, this thickness of that diffusion layer is uh, sensor model specific. Uh, the second uh, diffusion layer is flow dependent, it's on the seawater side, and it can be parameterized accurately for pumped optodes such as Seabird 63s, but it's hard to parameterize uh, when the optode is not pumped, uh, such as for Andera uh, optodes. Uh, this model is also temperature dependent because diffusion is a temperature dependent process. And finally, um, the correction, uh, the response time corrections have not been implemented for uh, GoBGC floats uh, or any, um, any floats that we process that we um, report to the Argo uh, data centers. And this is because um, uh, in order to do this response time correction, we need timestamps for each measurement. And it's not always uh, available for all the floats uh, that we have deployed in the past. And then so we're trying to figure out a way to um, kind of figure out how to do these corrections. And um, hopefully we'll start implementing these response time corrections in the near future. But at this point, um, uh, response, uh, response time corrections are not implemented. Okay, so now that we know how all these four parameters slash processes uh, can affect the oxygen measurements and we know how to correct for them, we are now ready to equip this optode onto a profiling float and then start collecting um, measurements in the ocean. Fortunately, uh, these optodes are very stable once they are deployed. So this is a plot that shows the oxygen concentration at park depth over about 600 days 
uh, and the oxygen measurements are shown in the gray uh, circle. So you can see that over um, about two years, uh, the oxygen measurements really didn't drift by, uh, drift by much at all. And so, you know, this is this was great news, and this was one of the reasons why optodes became the, you know, the preferred choice by the oceanographic community on profiling floats because of this stability. However, um, the problem is, even though optodes are very stable once deployed, they actually drift quite a bit before they are deployed, and that could lead to large errors in calibration at the time of deployment. And this drift is commonly referred to as the storage drift. And this plot uh, uh, shows the storage drift of three, uh, three optos over about uh, five years. So you can see uh, the y-axis is uh, it, y-axis represents the drift in the, ox, the optode uh, calibration in percent. And so over about the course of five years, all three of these optodes drifted uh, low by about 15%. And so this is problematic uh, because if your optode is calibrated uh, here uh, in the pink arrow, depending on when the uh, profiling flow was deployed, uh, you know whether it be a year or two or three years after the factor calibration, the uh, you would expect the uh, you can expect that the oxygen uh, measurements from these optodes would be biased uh, significantly low by you know five to ten, even 13, 14 percent. And then so uh, this time lag between the calibration and time of deployment is what leads to these storage uh, drift errors. And they can be pretty significant errors when they are deployed. And so this is a plot that uh, demonstrates uh, that this is a very common trait. You know, so this is over a dozen, pro a dozen optodes that was calibrated over six years. And all, every single one of them drifted low and showed a very similar response, uh, um, shape of response. Uh, there is some good news to this, and that um, if you focus, uh, look at these two plots here, um, you can burn in the uh, optos, which means that you take a couple million measurements uh, before uh, they are equipped on, you know, before they're used in the field, and then by quote unquote burning in the sensors, uh, this tends to reduce the magnitude of the drift, as you can see in the plot on the right, and the plot on the left is an optode that did not have uh, any uh, any treatment like that. And then so by burning in optodes, the magnitude of drift can be reduced by about 50%, which is great. But you still have, uh, you can still expect, you know, drift of, you know, 5 6% over a couple of years. So that doesn't fully solve the problem. Uh, fortunately, the good news is that uh, we, um, or not me, but you know, the, the community has figured out a way to accurately correct for uh, such a drift. And so this plot shows uh, the uh, residual, uh, or it shows a drift on the y-axis, so it's the residual between the optode measurement and the Winkler measurement uh, as a function of the Winkler measurement on the x-axis. And then so the initial point, this is when it was first calibrated, are the um, green dots uh, scattered around zero at the top of the plot. As you can see, over the course of several years, um, the sensor drifted low. But the sensor drifts in a linear fashion, which means that, uh, as you can see from these dotted lines here. So what that means is that the sensors can then be recalibrated or corrected for, but just by applying a two-point um, correction, so basically a gain uh, obtained from you know some reference in this case Winkler's at you know around 100% saturation and also an offset which is the measurement at zero um, at zero oxygen concentration. And just as a side note, you know, so uh, it has been shown that these corrections should be done in oxygen space uh, rather than uh, applying a correction to the phase data directly, uh, shown uh, shown by the plot up top. So the left is a residual. If you uh, apply the correction in the phase, and then the, the plot on the right shows the residual. Uh, if you apply the correction in PO2 space, you can see that clearly the residuals are much uh, tighter and smaller if the correction is applied in PO2 space. So uh, when making these uh, corrections for sensor drift, we always want to make the corrections in uh, PO2 or oxygen concentration space. And then so again, the you know the equation to correct for uh, the sensor drift is you know uncorrected partial pressure of oxygen times multiplied by a gain factor plus the offset. And by far the dominant uh, source 
or the and the biggest um, correction term is the gain and the offset is typically small and it's on the order of maybe one to two micromole per kilogram over multiple years okay so but we so even though we know how to correct for the drift we still have to correct for the drift and we still haven't solved the problem entirely and so one approach would be to try to calibrate these sensors right before the flow deployment so that we can minimize the storage drift but this is not a, um, a realistic solution uh, because that would just take to, you know, that would just, the, the logistical complications would be too great and unfeasible in most, um, in most cases. And then the solution that the community has really developed over the past um, 10 or so years is to conduct in situ air calibrations uh, so that we can adjust for uh, the sensor drift once the sensors, uh, once the sensors are deployed. So I'll go through uh, the approach uh, now. So uh, air calibrations take advantage of the fact that the profiling floats uh, need to come up to the surface to telemeter data uh, back home. And then so when the floats are at the surface, the optode uh, shown in the blue uh, in the blue box there uh, is exposed to the atmosphere. And the optodes, since they respond to since they respond to to partial pressures of oxygen, it actually has the same response in air and seawater. So it doesn't the opto doesn't care if it's in seawater or in air. It just it will just respond to the partial pressure of oxygen to whatever media it is exposed to. And then fortunately, because the oxygen composition of uh, the atmosphere is very constant, we can actually calculate what the partial pressure of oxygen is uh, in the air using this equation. So the PO2 of the air is equal to uh, the XO2, which is the, um, which is the, the percentage of the oxygen in, at in the air uh, multiplied by the total pressure of the atmosphere uh, and after you correct for um, humidity, pH2O. And so basically coming back to this plot, what we do in the field, so now we have a reference oxygen measurement that, so we can calculate what the PO2 should be in the air and then we can compare that against our sensor reading and then we can use that to correct for sensor drift. So coming back to this plot, uh, we can get these, you know, these measurements near 100% saturation from air measurements. And unfortunately, we don't get a zero measurement in the field uh, very often, but we, so we assume that there is no um, zero drift. And then uh, this assumption is validated um, uh, by analyzing profiling floats that are deployed in anoxic basins where we know the ox oxygen concentration uh, is zero. And then uh, in analyzing over 20 floats in such basins, uh, we typically see um, a drift of this zero of less than one micromole per kilogram over multiple years. So, um, so you know, by by ignoring the zero drift, which should lead to um, very minimal uh, errors in the um, in the oxygen. So, anyways, then now, so in C two air calibration, um, uh, the equation simplifies to so we ignore the offset, and then so now the uh, optode reading can be corrected by just multiplying a gain factor to the uh, to the uncorrected sensor output. And then so this correction can be applied in either PO2 or also oxygen concentration. And then the gain is calculated simply by the partial pressure of oxygen in air, which we calculate using the equation at the top of the slide, and divided by the PO2 of the optode, which is just the output of the sensor itself. So it's fairly straightforward to do. Uh, there are some small complications that we need to consider when making air calibrations, and the main one is the carryover effect. And that's uh, and the effects are shown in this plot here. And so this is the surface uh, measurements of seawater shown in green, and then the air, uh, air measurements shown in black, and a climatology oxygen uh, shown in pink. And these are all percent, uh, percent oxygen on the y-axis. So this is data for over about three years. And so you can see there's a pronounced seasonal cycle driven by biological production during the uh, summer months, and spring and summer months, and the surface seawater and um, shown in the green. Uh, but the air oxygen measurements should be independent and they shouldn't have any seasonal cycle because the pressure, uh, partial pressure of oxygen should remain fairly uh, constant throughout uh, a seasonal cycle. But you can see that there is a clear seasonal cycle 
also in the air measurements that coincides with the surface seawater measurements. And this is, uh, we assume this is because uh, when, this, when the uh, float is at the surface, it bops up and down and therefore periodically gets submerged. And then so the, when, it's, when it's making air measurements, uh, there is this carryover from the surface seawater into the air measurements as well. Um, and so this effect can be kind of nicely seen by plotting up the percent oxygen in air uh, on the y-axis versus the percent oxygen uh, on the x-axis. And then so if there was no carryover, no contamination, then uh, this should have a slope of zero, which means that the readings in the air is independent of the readings in uh, the surface seawater. Uh, so any slope will is kind of the uh, percent contamination uh, uh, of the surface seawater. Um, so uh, the approach that we take in GoBGC is that we assume that over a seasonal cycle, this carryover effect kind of averages out, and therefore we can get an uh, accurate gain if uh, we have multiple years of data. So uh, we average, uh, once we have at least one year of data, then we just average all of the um, air gain values and then call that the um, gain for our oxygen floats. Another benefit for the air calibration is that we can correct for sensor drift uh, once the float is deployed. So I mentioned earlier that the sensor doesn't uh, sensor is very stable once deployed, but uh, some of the optodes do exhibit a small but noticeable uh, drift of typically about a couple tenths of a percent per year. And then so over the lifetime of a float of five to six years, that can accumulate to you know one to two percent. So over time, this uh, could get significant. Uh, so this is a um, uh, this is a plot that sh uh, shows the change in gain, uh, the air gains plotted on the white uh, plot plotted on the y-axis over about three years, and you can see, as you can see, uh, the gain decreases by about you know percent, uh, a little bit more than a percent um, over the course of the life of this float. And uh, but this demonstrates that the air calibrations are robust and accurate enough that uh, these really small uh, that's capable of detecting the small um, drift over time. And the approach that we take in GoBGC is that we only correct for drift when the float uh, is deployed for at least two years. And then, even then, we only apply a sensor drift if uh, the, uh, the computed drift is significant uh, using the Bayesian information criteria. And so uh, we, when we analyze the SOCOM uh, uh, array uh, of 126 floats that had been deployed for at least two years, uh, about, about a quarter of them, 32 of them, had a significant drift with a mean drift of negative 0.07 plus or minus 0.65% per year. Um, so, and then so, you know, some sensors drifted high and some sensors drifted low uh, with a range of about negative 1.1 to 1.2% uh, per year. Um, unfortunately, uh, not all optodes are capable of making air measurements. So I mentioned this in, uh, at the beginning of the talk, uh, but the Onderas are capable of making air calibrations because they're exposed to the environment, but the Seabird 63s are not capable of making air calibrations because they are integrated into the pumped flow stream. So, um, but you know, the, but the Seabird 63s are uh, prone to the storage drift as well, so we need to come up with a different uh, approach to correct for uh, correct for the storage drift, and there are basically two options. The first and the preferred option is to use uh, if uh, Winkler uh, measurements, so discrete samples at the time of deployment. So if you if you're if you're fortunate enough to have the uh, discrete samples collected at the time of deployment, then you can match the uh, float oxygen, which is shown on the uh, y-axis, to the Winkler oxygen shown on the x-axis, um, and then compute a gain that way. And then, and then use that uh, gain moving forwards. Uh, one you know, caution to using this approach is that there can be mismatches, uh, either due to slow sensor response or you know, just different um, water masses between uh, 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 the discrete samples and the float measurements. So you have to be a little bit careful about how you match your discrete samples to, um, to your float oxygen. But when we compare, uh, so the majority of the SOCOM uh, floats 
were deployed with discrete samples uh, that were collected alongside. And when we compare the air calibrated uh, gains versus the Wingler calibrated gains, we get a mean difference of negative 0.31 plus minus 2.2%. So uh, we kind of think that this approach is accurate to about 2%. The second option, uh, if there are no Winklers that are available at the time of um, deployment, then uh, we can correct, we can estimate a gain using a climatology. In this case, we use the World Ocean Atlas. So basically, the idea is that uh, using a climatology, you can um, estimate what the surface oxygen saturation should be, and then uh, compare that to the um, to the flow measurements and then compute a gain. And we only use this approach when there's at least one year of data uh, uh, for the float. And so this is a plot that compares the air gains computed on the x-axis versus this climatology approach on the y-axis. So most floats show a fairly good agreement. Uh, the floats uh, in the parentheses are near ice floats where the climatology uncertainties are much higher. So uh, there is good agreement uh, between the air gains and the climatology approach, um, but we think that uh, the uncertainty for this approach is about plus or minus 3%. So I guess one of the take-homes from this is that um, it's important, so not all ox opt-in measurements are, have the same uncertainty in the Argo data center, so it's important to uh, look into like what uncertainties are associated with the measurements uh, because they're going to be different depending on how they were, um, whether or not how they were calibrated and whether or not they had uh, air calibrations or not. Okay, so all of these air calibrations can be validated um, using discrete samples as well. So when floats deployed, um, we can also uh, collect discrete samples alongside to validate uh, how the air calibrations, uh, how the air calibrations do. And then so discrete samples uh, were collected for the majority of the profiling floats deployed in the SOCOM project. So over 200 floats have now been deployed in the Southern Ocean. And so you know a comparison over 2,000 samples between float oxygen and bottle oxygen has a median residual of negative 0.35 plus or minus 6.8 micromole per kilogram. And uh, there is some spatial temporal differences uh, between the float and the bottle oxygen because the float typically surfaces about 18 hours after deployment, and they can drift, you know, up five to 10 kilometers from the deployment location during that time. And so we expect some of this variability to be real spatial temporal differences between the two measurements. So assuming about 50% of this uh, variability is due to the spatial temporal differences, we think uh, that the oxygen measurements after they are air calibrated has an accuracy of about three micromole per kilogram. So this is the assessment at the time of float deployment. So how about uh, throughout, uh, throughout the life of the float? So one way we can assess that is to assess, uh, to, to compare crossover crossovers between pro, uh, float profiles and GLODAP, uh, GLODAP stations. And we define a crossover as uh, any measurements made uh, within 20 kilometers of one another. And by comparing the crossovers within the first six months of the float's life versus uh, measurements made when the float has been deployed uh, for at least two years, we can then assess the kind of long-term uh, stability and quality of the float oxygen measurements. So this plot shows that comparison with the younger floats on the top and then the older floats on the bottom. And you can see that on average, the glow depth measurements are about you know, a couple micromolar higher than the float measurements. And we attributed this to the fact that the glow depth measurements are um, are on average about 20 years older than the float measurements. And so this discrepancy is in part or largely driven by uh, the deoxygenation of the um, of the Southern Ocean because the majority of these comparisons happen uh, in the Southern Ocean. And comparing the literature values, the magnitude uh, roughly matches up. And so, um, uh, but you can see that the shape of the, uh, the mean and the shape of the uh, residuals between GLODAP and floats don't change over time, which indicates that the quality of the float measurements don't degrade over time. Okay, so now I want to finish this talk by coming back to this um, animation that I showed you at the very beginning of um, the talk. And the oxygen measurements are the most common uh, biogeochemical sensor that's deployed on profiling floats and has the longest history and the longest time series dating back to 2002. 
and not you know there has been a lot of improvements made in the sensor technology as well as you know uh, the methods to correct for drift and also the calibrated in C2 and then the quality of the oxygen measurements have improved dramatically over the um, past um, past decade or so and so now most of the profiling floats that are being deployed are you know are optos that have been multi-point calibrated and are capable of doing air calibrations and this uh, the number of these high quality oxygen profiles uh, will you know, continue to increase over the next many years so you know i hope that um you have learned something that will allow you to take advantage of this emerging data set and i hope uh, that you enjoy our go B uh, go bgc science workshop and thank you very much for uh, thank you very much for your time and listening to this video